it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker in this panel, Professor Jeremy Waldron from New York U University. And his new book, One Another Equals, The Basis of e Human Equality, was just published by Harvard University Press and is, is based on the remind me? Gifford Lectures. Gifford Lectures. So please. All right, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to speak into this microphone so we don't have to have people rushing in. Um, so we're talking about responsibilities in this conference. And um, one thing that we've kind of been assuming since yesterday morning is that we are dealing with a contrast between rights and responsibilities. And we ask why people who have talked about rights haven't talked equally about responsibilities. We understand that the two are connected uh, as two sides of the same coin in the relation of co-relativity. And I don't want to disparage that. And I don't want to disparage some other talk of responsibilities that's been going on. But in this paper, I want to explore the possibility that some rights, if not all rights, can best be understood as responsibilities. So. Um, we need to under, understand and remember that some rights actually function just as responsibilities. And I want to explore the logic of those rights and give a few examples. I don't think that's true of all rights, but I believe it is true of a great, of a great many of them. So here's an example. This is a, a right listed in Article 6 of the German Basic Law. It's the, um, the right of parents. It begins with the general assertion that marriage and family enjoy the special protection of the state. And there, under heading two, comes what particularly interests me. The care and upbringing of children are the natural right of parents and a duty primarily incumbent on them. See, we're presenting the right and the duty in the same, in the same clause. And the state watches over the performance of this, um, this duty. What's interesting is the designation of the care and upbringing of children as both a right and a duty incumbent on parents. It's a task that has to be assigned to somebody. It is assigned by natural law and the law of the state to the parents, and the parents are then protected in that position against interference um, by others. Even though it's a duty, it, it nevertheless has the aspect of a right it's something that the parents are entitled to do. It's based on their interest in the matter. Um, that's the, the, the basis of giving them the choices that will be protected by the right. True, those choices can't, are not unlimited. And there is some suggestion in Clause 3 of Article 6 that maybe the parents will lose their rights if they abuse the choices given to them. Children may be separated from their families against the will of their parents or guardians only in pursuant to a law and only if the parents fail in their duties or the children are otherwise in danger of serious um, neglect. But that's an extreme backup position and it leaves an immense amount of space for the freedom and the choice of the parent. So this is interesting. We have a, uh, a norm that protects freedom and choice. It's based on the parent's interest, but it expresses both a duty and a right as bound up, not two sides of the same coin, the same side of the same, the same coin. And I actually think a lot of rights, I'm not saying this about all rights, but a lot of rights are like this. They have this general shape to them. I'm offering a rough definition of what I call responsibility rights, that they involve, as the parental, as the parental case did, they involve the designation of an important task, namely the rearing and upbringing of children, they involve the privileging of somebody as the person to perform that task, namely the parents. They do so in view of the particular interest that that person has in the matter. I think that's quite important for conceiving of this as a right following Raz's interest theory uh, of rights. And the um, involves the protection of the decision making of that person pursuant to this responsibility against interference by others, even against interference by the state, except in the extreme cases that I've mentioned. I think it's, it's an interesting general form to consider how many rights actually <coughs> satisfy that 
general schema. Far from logically rigorous, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Let me give you a less reputable example. The Second Amendment to the United States Constitution notoriously protects the right of the people to keep and bear weapons. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And for a lot of Americans, that's all that you need to know about the Second Amendment. But if you read it carefully, you find it actually has a preamble to it. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It looks as, as though, again, you have the designation of an important task, namely um, the, the freedom protection aspect of a militia, the privileging of somebody as a person to perform that task, any citizen, doing so in view of the particular interest that that person has in the matter, that they want to use their weapons to maintain their freedom, and the protection of their decision-making uh, against uh, interference by the state, except in extreme cases of abuse. It's not the most reputable right in the world, and many people wish it were not in the Constitution, but there, but there it is. Um, many rights that accrue to citizens have this, have this character. Karl Marx once famously distinguished in commenting on, on the, the French Revolutionary Declaration of Rights between the rights of man and the rights of the citizen. He thought the rights of the citizen do express certain social responsibilities and an awareness of social connection and social solidarity. I'm not pursuing a Marxian account, but it is interesting to consider some of the rights associated with citizenship. So if I may be excused for introducing another American controversy, first of all, we have the right to bear arms, the example that I've just given. We may also think in this way about the campaign that took place some years ago to allow openly gay men and women to serve in the military. Gay men and women demanded the right to serve in the military. Uh, they, they, they thought of this as a matter of right, and so it is. But the right that it is is a right to serve. It's a right to discharge a responsibility associated with citizenship. Not every citizen has to serve in the military. The United States differs from Israel in, in that regard. But nevertheless, even for those who volunteer to serve, that what they're, they're signing up for is a, is a duty. And gay men and gay women are saying, there's no reason why we shouldn't be allowed to assume this duty as well. They saw it as a right. They saw it as a matter of service. It's a responsibility right in, in many ways. And I think that's, um, that uh, satisfies the schema um, that I set out as well. A second set of citizenship rights are political rights, such as the various forms of citizen participation in the political life of a democratic community. Um, think, for example, of the democratic franchise, the right to be enrolled as an elector, the right to vote in an election. These are classic political rights. They were key to the civil rights movement, for example, in, the, in, the, in America in the 1960s. They're classical political rights. People campaigned in a heartfelt way for these, for these individual rights. But the very same right can be viewed as a responsibility, responsibility in several dimensions. First of all, it's a right that it has consequences, so you ought to exercise it in a responsible way. And that's not quite what I'm getting at when I talk about responsibility rights. In many countries, it's understood that it's a, it's a matter of legal responsibility to actually exercise the right to vote. So, for example, in Australia, uh, the Commonwealth Electoral Act states in Section 245 that it shall be the duty of every elector to vote at each election. Yeah? It's, not a, it's not an option. You have to vote. Um, the actual duty of the elector has got to be that the elector must go to a polling place they must have their name marked off the certified list of electors. They must receive a ballot paper and take it to an individual voting booth. They must mark it, fold it, and place it in the ballot box. It doesn't say what they must write on the, on the, on the, on the, on the ballot paper. They can write anything they like. They don't necessarily have to express a preference for one of the, but they have to go through the exercise. They have to take the time out, and sometimes in elections that means standing in line for a certain period and um, 
make an effort because it's felt that this is a social responsibility. It's a social responsibility. Um, but again, the social responsibility is not correlative to the right. It really is the right itself in this, in this arrangement. And all of this in Australia is enforced with a penalty of $50. If you fail to turn up, you'll get something like a uh, traffic infringement notice. Other countries that, involve, that impose a legal duty to, write, to vote include Argentina, Fiji, Peru, Singapore, Switzerland, and I'm told Turkey. And in addition, there are countries like Italy where in theory there's a legal duty to vote, but there is in fact no enforcement of it. In my view, in every democracy, there is a duty to vote. It's just not necessarily a legally enforced duty. But that duty is, it's the same side of the coin as the right to vote. The right is a right to serve in this, in this particular example. In Australia, where they have continual debate about whether to repeal the relevant provision of the Commonwealth Electoral Act, the element of compulsion is often opposed on the ground that voting is properly regarded as a right and therefore ought to be voluntary. And defenders of the compulsion element appeal to the fact that many rights are limited in various ways by social duties, and so they are. I don't want to talk to that matter. Others have talked to it already in the last couple of days. But both positions seem to me to neglect the point that rights may themselves be considered as responsibilities and that the importation of the element of compulsion is not necessarily to be conceived as something brought in from the outside, whether justified or unjustified, to limit the right. It's not a way of limiting the right. It's bound up with the right itself. It's exactly like the rights of parents, yeah? which is it's a responsibility that they have for their children, and that's not separable from the right. It's not the matter of bringing a social duty as an alien element or a different element uh, into, into the picture. Also, the element of right, particularly in the voting case, has a clear sense of empowerment and a clear sense of choice that is unaffected by the element of compulsion. That the voter may exercise her right as she pleases, voting for whomever she likes or even none of the above, and her voting in this way represents a degree of control that she has over the political system assigned to her on an equal basis with its assignment to every other citizen. Parents, of course, have a uh, controlling choice over the upbringing of their children. As a voter, I don't have a controlling choice. I'm not a, di a dictator, but I have the same element of choice as any other elector. And my vote, which I must cast, is then tallied up along with the votes of all the other millions of electors taking part in the, in the uh, religion, in the, in the exercise in the election. So these elements of choice and empowerment in the case of voting, they're not limited by the duty of compulsion. On the contrary, the compulsion represents a requirement that you must come here and you must make a choice. Yeah? Now your choice can be oriented to your own interests or your view of the social interests, but you must make a choice. We can't have a democracy unless people are making a choice of this kind. The requirement is that the citizen must accept the empowerment offered to her by the democratic franchise, even though she may exercise that empowerment as she pleases. Let me give one other um, example, which I think helps to, to uh, emphasize the importance of the right to vote. The other main participatory element in many political systems is jury service. The, um, we say the responsibility, but sometimes um, the right of people to serve on juries in criminal trials and in the United States many civil, civil trials as well. Now when you receive a notice of jury service, it seems like a, um, a, um, an irksome burden that the city of New York or the, 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 the government of New York or the government of the United States is imposing on you. Some of my friends from the US will have served on juries and it takes a lot of time and it's poorly compensated, but you, you must go, and, and uh, most of us think of it primarily as a burden. We think of it primarily as a duty. For a long time, women were not permitted to serve on juries, and my friend Linda Kerber, who wrote a wonderful book called No Constitutional Right to be Ladies, Women and the Obligation of Citizenship, which is a book from 1998, um, 
devoted several chapters to the campaign that women undertook in the 1930s and 40s to acquire the right to serve on duties. Now, again, what they're seeking to acquire is something that certainly has the form of a responsibility. And as I said, it's often viewed by us as a matter of um, burden, but it's, it's uh, nevertheless was seen as a privilege of citizenship. It's a right to serve. It's a, um, it's a little bit like military service in a system of con selective conscription. Um, but it's uh, something that women demanded as a matter of, of their civil rights, and it's emphatically like seeking a responsibility equal to the civic responsibility shouldered in this regard by men. Voting is not compulsory in the United States, even though registration, even registration to vote is not compulsory in the United States. I don't know what the situation is in Israel. In New Zealand, where I grew up, it was compulsory to register to vote, but uh, not compulsory uh, to vote, despite the proximity of Australia ac across the Tasman Sea. In the United States, it's usually made difficult to register to vote rather than uh, being compulsory. But in other respects, Linda Kerber says that jury service, like voting, is seen as a civil obligation that corresponds to a civil right. The citizen who does not respond to a summons to serve on a jury faces sanctions ranging from fines to contempt of court. The, the one interesting thing about the, the jury case that places it on the far side of the parental case, parental case involves a degree of choice, but the choice is not absolutely unlimited. Um, the voting case involves very considerable choice among the candidates. Military service case doesn't involve a great deal of choice uh, involved, so it's not really a liberty right in that sense, but it is seen as a right. And jury service is understood um, as not involving a great deal of choice. You can't just go there and vote for the person whom you judge it would be convenient for you to convict or acquit. Your um, exercise of choice is highly structured, and the conditions of its responsible exercise are uh, uh, closely guarded by the authorities in the courtroom. But nevertheless, it protects an element of choice. It's based on your interest as a citizen in participating in the jury system. It's understood as a burden that must be shared among the citizens in some sort of fair way. And people who don't have the opportunity to serve will generally see this as a right that they're demanding, which has this responsibility aspect. So it seemed to me that this, this is a further, is a further um, uh, example of one of the responsibility rights of citizens. Somebody yesterday, I forget whether it was Sam or somebody following him, spoke about, maybe Sergio, uh, spoke, spoke about Max Weber's um, arg arg <laughs> argument about politics as a vocation. And Weber distinguishing between the ethic of responsibility associated with all, with all um, uh, political participation, but particularly professional political participation as a vocation, and contrasted it with various modes of irresponsible exercise, such as the ethics of ultimate convictions and uncompromising principles. And if I had unlimited time, I'd want to explore that general idea that political participation overall, in any of the multiple ways in which we exercise it has a responsibility dimension to it. And what we value when we demand our rights as participants is, a, is demanding to be credited with the responsible exercise of the duties of citizenship. We may quibble with Weber's particular example, but, but as uh, Sergio mentioned yesterday, it's very important to think about this in relation to this notion of responsibilities. <coughs> Notice that I'm using the term responsibility here rather than primarily duty. Um, I do think some of the distinctions between these concepts, responsibility, duty, and obligation, are important. Um, responsibility and duty are sometimes contrasted because your responsibilities involve an element of choice and discretion that you have to exercise. You're responsible for making this. And what you would normally say when others try to interfere is, no, that's for me to make this decision. You know, your child is misbehaving on the airplane and the passenger on the other seat starts to tell the child to shut up and you say, no, no, it's for me to tell the child to shut up. It's my responsibility. 
as opposed to duty, which is seen as involving less of a discretion, less of an element of choice. But um, it, it's, I think, no accident that we are pursuing this general theme of the role of duties under the auspices of this term responsibility, which gives me the opening to make this argument that uh, many rights have this responsibility dimension to them. Now, I've talked about the rights of citizens. What about the rights of man, as Marx would say? What about the rights of humans and persons generally? What if we uh, think about natural rights? Uh, how should we conceive of these in relation to responsibilities? Here, the analysis starts to become a little bit more strained, but by no means non-existent. Um, there are traces of the responsibility <coughs> idea in the classic theory of natural rights. In, Vir in the state of Virginia in 1785, James Madison described the right to religious freedom in terms that also use the language of duty. He says, we hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that the religion of every man must be left to his conviction and conscience. And it's the right of every man, the right of every man, to exercise it as these may dictate. This right is in its nature unalienable because what is here a right towards men is a duty towards the creator. Uh, it's, an interesting, it, it, it's an interesting possibility that we think about um, the duty as being owed to God even though against other men, over against other men, it represents itself as a right imbued with the choice of every man to render to the creator such homage as he believes to be acceptable to God. This is in Madison's memorial and remonstrance against um, religious assessments, a very famous uh, document uh, in addressing the, uh, the Virginia legislature's proposal to establish um, some provision for teachers of the Christian religion. Madison was thoroughly opposed to any such intervention. So we have the, the, um, the free exercise of religion presents itself as a paradigmatic uh, right that individuals have, but certainly it will be experienced by many believers as a right for them to be able to carry out their religious duties, as a right for them to be able to carry out their um, uh, responsibilities. And certainly the religious grounding of many theories of natural rights produce rights which have exactly this responsibility form. John Locke grounded the basic right to life and physical integrity in terms of a duty that we have to maintain our being. Men are, he said, all the workmanship of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker. This is absolutely fundamental in Locke's argument. Sent into the world by his order and about his business, and so they are his property whose workmanship they are, made to last during his, not one another's, pleasure. And being furnished with like faculties, sharing all in one community of nature, there cannot be supposed any such subordination among us that may authorize us to destroy one another as if we were made for one another's uses as the inferior ranks of creatures uh, for ours. The whole basis of our rights, of our natural rights in Locke's account, is based on the fact that we have a responsibility to serve the purposes of the Creator who sent us into the world and not necessarily to serve each other per other's purposes. I may not destroy my life, said Locke, since it's something assigned to me, entrusted to me by my creator to be used for his purposes, and by exactly the same token, you, know, you may not destroy my life either, because that too would be encroaching upon a responsibility that has been assigned to me. Indeed, even Lockean property rights, uh, natural rights of property, were sometimes conceived in this light, not simply as unlimited privileges of use and exclusion, but as modes of affirmative response to God's commandment to be fruitful and to multiply and to make the earth fit for greater and greater number, numbers of inhabitants. God, by commanding to subdue, gave us authority to appropriate. You hear there the elements of right and responsibility tied together in that, uh, in that account. So there's certainly some evidence in the natural rights tradition for thinking of natural rights also as responsibilities. Beyond this, things get vaguer and less determinate so far as the responsibility dimension of rights is concerned. In the Enlightenment, rights were associated with the idea of a calling or a vocation for every person. In the words of Condorcet, they were rights to which we are called by nature, which has a vague background element of responsibility, that nature is calling us to to stand up like men and 
uh, perform our rights. It's also echo echoed the same theme that rights, that natural rights are in some sense responsibilities and they're associated with the assignment to a being capable of bearing those responsibilities. You find that echoed in what Enlightenment philosophers say about the way we bear and conduct ourselves in our individual and social lives. There's a sort of a, um, I call it moral orthopedics. There's a sort of a moral orthopedics associated with with uh, being a bearer of rights, that we have a responsibility to stand up straight, stand up for ourselves, walk upright in the presence of other men, don't grovel, um, we should have a certain sort of presence or uprightness of bearing, self-possession and self-control, indomitability, self-presentation as somebody to be reckoned with, and this is not just serving our own interests, but it's our responsibility to present humanity in ourselves in, in this way. Be no man's lackey, says Immanuel Kant, in the metaphysics of morals. Do not let others tread with impunity on your rights. Bowing and scraping before a human being seems in any case unworthy of human, human dignity. And I believe the notion of dignity associated with Kant is just not, not just the notion of being of inestimable value, but as a, a matter of presenting yourself as a responsibility to present yourself as the being you are, which is a being uh, already embodying the dignity of the moral law. We are responsible for standing up indomitably for our own rights. And attributing rights to human beings is partly attributing to them the capacity to take responsibility for their rights. And equally, we are capable of standing up for the rights of others, taking joint responsibility with all others for the whole regime of rights which has been entrusted, entrusted to us. All of this is important, I think, for reasons that Sam Moyne talked about yesterday morning, and I want to take a slightly different line um, than he pursued, particularly regarding a most important book by uh, Richard Tuck called Natural Rights Theories, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 1979. Richard, who now teaches at Harvard, um, told a story about the emergence of the modern notion of subjective rights from the older notion of objective rights. You might say in the older notion of objective rights, I don't know, a priest has the right to say mass, which partly means that nobody but priests has the right to say mass, but it also means that the priest has a duty to say, to say mass, and right was just a, uh, one way of uh, presenting those duties in a particularly individualized form. And Richard tells the story in his book about the emergence by the 16th century of understandings of rights that were much more discretionary, much more propertized, much more a matter of individual property than this, so that your right was not just a responsibility which you had, but it was conceived of as a property of the right bearer to do with as he pleases. And it's sometimes we can read Richard's account as though it were just about that transition from objective to subjective. But the intriguing thing is that beginning in the, in the late 16th and early, and, and the whole of the 17th century, we began to circle back round to a more objective understanding of rights, particularly in the notion of inalienable rights. Inalienable rights, which doesn't just mean very, very important rights, but means rights that you cannot give up and why can't you give up? Because they represent responsibilities that are incumbent upon you. So even in apparently um, strong defenders of subjective rights like Hobbes, who talks about your right to survive, and you also talks about your duty to survive. You cannot give up uh, your right to survive. You can't promise uh, to let it go. And by the time you get to a theorist like John Locke, rights of all sorts are being presented as inalienable. You cannot give them up. There can't be a consensual basis for slavery in the world because slaves do not have a power over their own fundamental liberty to alienate it to others. They have a responsibility to maintain their liberty. There cannot be contractarian defenses of absolutism because people do not have the absolute control over their own lives and destiny that would enable them to be able to trade those away uh, for, for uh, security or any of the other goodies that an absolutist was um, pursuing. So many, yes, thank you. Many people began um, pursuing the idea that even if 
in principle rights were subjective rights, subject to choice, sometimes they would say interpretive charity requires us to reject any account of what a person had said or done that had him alienating his life or liberty. That would be the act of a madman, they would sometimes say, or that would be the act of a violation of a trust, and we must try to find some other interpretation of what he was doing. And certainly by the time you get to John Locke's work towards the end of the um, 17th century, or by the time you get to Thomas Jefferson's famous assertion of men being endowed by their creator with certain fundamental and inalienable rights, it's now a direct position that there are certain rights that we have that we may not give up, that we have our responsibility to treasure and exercise. So, again, I find, just because John Locke is my man, and I've been working on him for as long, long as I can remember, Locke said this about slavery. A man, not having the power of his own life, cannot by compact or his own consent enslave himself to anyone nor put himself under the absolute arbitrary power of another to take away his life when he pleases. Nobody can give up more power than he has. Sounds, it's, it's a pretty stern position on liberty. Your liberty is, as it were, entrusted to you. It's not your property that you own in a true sense. And the result of this, which I mean, he plants this bomb at the beginning of the book and, and the bomb goes off uh, towards the end of the book when he's talking about absolute government, Though the legislature be the supreme power in every commonwealth, yet it, it cannot possibly be absolutely arbitrary over the lives and fortunes of the people. For it's based on the joint power of every member of the society given up to the person or assembly which is the legislature, and it can be no more than those persons had in a state of nature. Nobody can transfer to another person more power than he has in himself, and nobody has an absolute arbitrary power over himself. A man, as has been proved, cannot subject himself to the arbitrary power of another. It's of enormous political consequence, this idea of inalienable rights. And it is, I think, very deeply tied up with the notion of rights and responsibilities. I referred in the title that I had given for this conference to the role of dignity in all of this, and I just want to say a little bit about that. Um, it's now customary to hold that human rights are based in human dignity. And it's worth noticing that human dignity often presents itself not as a fully emancipatory ideal, but as an ideal that imposes responsibilities on the people who bear it. So, for example, in the famous uh, dwarf tossing case from France uh, in the 1990s, you know, dwarf tossing is an activity that takes place in noisy bars where big burly men um, pick up little people and throw them and see who can throw them the furthest. And the little people who participate, participate consensually, participate for large sums of money. Their safety is protected by all sorts of little harnesses and paddings and, and, uh, and so on. But the police in a French town near Paris held that this was inherently demeaning to human beings and that the protection of human dignity was an element of the public order that they were required to uphold. And that notwithstanding the consensual nature of the exercise, the, the dwarf tossees, the, the little people who were being tossed, had betrayed the responsibility that they had to look out for their own dignity. Human dignity turned out to be not a fully emancipatory idea. It was bound up with the notion that we have a, a responsibility not to degrade ourselves. And it's exactly that responsibility that the right not to be degraded protects. Or there was a case in South Africa case of Jordan against the state, a seminal case in 2002 concerning laws about prostitution. The laws about prostitution were old apartheid era laws and they were challenged by sex workers who claimed that these were degrading to the dignity of prostitutes to be held criminally liable for their sex work. And the courts certainly found that there were many aspects of the police interaction with prostitutes that were degrading to prostitutes and needed needed to be stopped. But in a very important concurring judgment, L.B. Sachs and Cato Reagan, two of the most prominent members of the South African Constitutional Court at the time, said this. They said, our Constitution values human dignity, which inheres in various aspects of what it means to be a human being. One of these aspects is the fundamental dignity of the human body, which is not simply organic, neither is it something to be commodified. Our Constitution requires that it be re respected. 
We do not believe that the legal provision prohibiting prostitution can be said to be the cause of any limitation on the dignity of the prostitute, not per se. To the extent that the dignity of prostitutes is diminished, the diminution arises from the character of prostitution itself. This is one of the reasons why many people are concerned about human dignity as a value is that it seems to have this paternalistic aspect of responsibility for self that people are required to uh, uh, service uh, in their possession of human dignity. And I only mention this because I think conceiving of human rights as rooted in dignity is not the same as conceiving of them as rooted in liberty. It really is a, a, a partial responsibility notion, and I think it's important to understand that role that dignity is playing in modern, in modern uh, jurisprudence. Okay, I want to just head towards a, a, a conclusion. I said at the beginning that I wasn't sure whether the, analysis, the frame of analysis I offered um, implied that all rights should be read as responsibility rights. I've given you lots of examples, and it seems to me that I could equally well have given you a lot of examples of rights that cannot be read in, in this way. I don't know whether the right not to be tortured can be read as a responsibility, as a response. I mean, you could strain to read it in this way, but I'm not sure that there would be much use. So um, I'm, I'm inclined to say probably not. Probably not all rights can be read as responsibility rights, but many can. And the fact that many of them can <coughs> probably means that it's, it is initially a mistake to pose too stark a contrast between all this emphasis on human rights and not enough emphasis on responsibilities. I would rephrase that. There hasn't been enough emphasis on those rights which are responsibilities. I think generally I would say that there will be borderline and controversial cases about the extent of the responsibility bound up with any given right, and we could talk about examples of that, but I'm by no means maintaining it dogmatic position that all rights represent responsibilities. But undoubtedly some of them some of them do. So what am I saying? I'm saying that, you know, rights present themselves as line items in a long list. You know, rights have a sort of listishness. And we, you know, we're philosophers and we assume that, that these lists must be manifestations of a single underlying idea, but there's no reason to believe that. You know? So maybe what we need is an eclectic theory of rights, probably in this respect as in many other respects that I don't have time to go into. And in such eclecticism, the idea of a responsibility right needs to be listed and noticed. And so I conclude uh, with the notion that the idea of responsibility rights offers an important analytic resource, uh, both in the analysis of rights and in parsing the demand for recognition of responsibilities, as though that were an essentially anti-rights, or um, uh, uh, some idea that was reproachful of rights emphasis. If I'm right, some at least of the demand for responsibilities uh, can be associated with rights rather than separated with rights. Again, I don't want to be dogmatic about that either. I know that there are demands for responsibilities that don't have this intimate connection with rights, but some do. So some rights do present themselves as responsibilities, and some responsibilities that we have and need to emphasize are going to present themselves as rights. And I believe that this leads to a, a more um, accommodating understanding from both ends of the spectrum. Thank you very much indeed.